I'm Bill Walker, Managing Editor of WSOC Television. This year, Charlotte welcomes two exhibits of national acclaim. The artifacts of Egyptian ruler Ramses II will be on display at the Mint Museum from October through January. During that same time, a cortege of mummies, an exhibit co-sponsored by Channel 9, will be displayed at Discovery Place. Now, to help in your understanding of the significance of these exhibits, WSOC-TV has produced a series of reports on the country where many of these artifacts were found, Egypt. We travel this land for almost three weeks, learning about her history and her people. In part one of this series, you'll see and hear the sights and sounds of this diverse country, a land with almost 7,000 years of history. symbols of Egypt recognized around the world. Camels and their drivers silhouetted against an Egyptian sunset. Images of a faraway land most of us have only read about or seen in the movies. But there is another Egypt, a modern, crowded country of 52 million people, a proud nation struggling against widespread poverty at home and fighting for a place in the modern world. It's a country with more than 6,000 years of history. Its culture is a blend of Africa, Europe, and Asia. Egypt is both familiar and exotic. A trip to the market is woman's work here. There's fresh sausage made while you wait, and many fruits and berries to choose from. Perhaps a stop at the toy store where the shopkeeper sells his own creations. And always there's bread to take home. The men, meanwhile, may play a game of dominoes. Or perhaps smoke their water pipes. Burning tobacco is placed in the top of the pipe, and the smoke is cool as it passes through the water below. A stroll through a Cairo bazaar is a walk back into time. Many of these shops have not changed much at all in hundreds of years. Here's where tourists come for goodbyes if they're up to the challenge of the bargain. How much for one? This is eight pounds. For one? For each, this is handy me. This is papaya, this is not bananas. One cent. Papaya is not bananas. Yes, yes. Fifteen for three. It's Twenty-four. No, twenty-four. You give me last surprise. Twenty-two. I'll give you 20. Okay. Egyptians live along a narrow, fertile stretch of land that runs along the Nile River. Farmers have small crops of vegetables, like onions. This farmer is pulling sweet leaves from a tree, leaves that will later be turned into marmalade. Although much has been done to modernize irrigation along the Nile, many farmers still depend on primitive methods for water. And in southern Egypt, the weather is usually hot. Often animals still outnumber vehicles on the street, and the smell of dung hangs heavily in the air. Everywhere there are flies. In a land where it almost never rains, streets are always dusty or muddy from meager attempts to hold down the dust. For thousands of years, the Nile has been the best place to escape the heat and insects for man and beast. This water buffalo is doing his best to cool off. Beautiful felucca boats have sailed the Nile for centuries. 
and they still give visitors perhaps the most beautiful look at this land of the pharaohs. A quiet sunset along the Nile ends abruptly in Cairo. Cairo is a city of at least 12 million people, maybe 18 million. Nobody knows for sure. Egypt's population is growing at an alarming rate. 40% of all Egyptians are under the age of 15. Over a million babies are born every year. Yet there is no social security, no old age pension, no medical insurance. Poverty and unemployment are potentially explosive issues. Ironically, the most infamous political violence in modern Egypt was not, on the surface at least, a social protest. Religious radicals assassinated President Anwar Sadat in 1981. The news was shocking for Americans who had come to think of Sadat as a friend. His meeting with President Carter and Israeli Prime Minister Begin at Camp David had led to the Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. Sadat himself had turned Egypt away from depending on the Soviet Union for aid and toward a closer relationship with the United States and the West. But many Egyptians were not happy with Sadat's attempts to westernize their country. At thousands of mosques throughout Egypt, Muslims remove their shoes in a daily public ritual that symbolizes this nation's religious and social conservatism. Egypt stands with one foot in the 20th century and one foot that stretches back into the ages. The pyramids and the other old monuments in Egypt have stood up against cannonballs and desert winds, but they are no match for some modern enemies. In part two, you'll see how some of the things built by Ramses and others may be lost if something isn't done. Egypt, there are reminders of Ramses the Great. More than any other pharaoh, he left his mark on this land, covering Egypt with monuments and temples, all built more than 1,200 years before the time of Christ. The Ramesseum was a mortuary and temple, one of the largest in Egypt. It was this temple that inspired the poet Shelley to call Ramses King of Kings. Today, tourists trample what was once holy ground, and birds find a home in carvings once dedicated to the gods. Near the front is the fallen head of the Ramses statue, cut from a single stone. It fell during an earthquake in the year 27 BC. Time and nature still take a toll on Egyptian antiquities today, the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx are no exceptions. Every year they attract thousands of visitors. As for the fourth spear, which used to be four meters long, fell alone, but part of it in the British Museum. On commencé alors à mettre du sable sur cette pierre et la but Cairo, with its traffic and pollution, is closing in on the Giza Plateau. Underneath the great monuments, a rising water table is eroding their support. The Sphinx is crumbling, crumbling, even as the Egyptians try to prop it up. Efforts to save the Sphinx have really never ended, going all the way back to Greek and Roman times, extending right up to today with this modern scaffolding girded here against the efforts of a thousand yesterdays to save this marvelous piece of human achievement. This stone fell from the Sphinx two months ago, and that's triggered a crisis. The experts are worried. It's a very important part because it's from the body itself. Amal Samuel is an inspector of antiquities. It's her job to assess damage to the Sphinx. Now all restoration work has stopped while government experts decide what to do. They haven't decided what to do yet. I think not yet because it's not easy to decide a decision for this great uh, Sphinx.
Climbing the pyramids used to be a popular pastime here. To protect the pyramids and the tourists, climbing is now forbidden, but some do it anyhow. There are about 80 pyramids in Egypt, but the three in Giza are the largest and the most famous. It's difficult for pictures to capture the scope of the Great Pyramid, truly one of the wonders of the world. Each side is about the length of two and a half football fields. It was built with more than two million stone blocks, each weighing about two and a half tons. The stones were assembled without mortar and fitted perfectly. But how did workers using primitive tools 4,000 years ago handle these huge stones? We may never know. If you look to what we have since ancient Egypt of records of how the ancient Egyptian built a pyramid, you will find nothing. As general director of the pyramids, Dr. Zahi Hawass has spent most of his life trying to understand what happened here and why. The pyramid, he says, is a symbolic palace pointing towards the sun, built to please the gods, all to ensure that the pharaoh who built it would become a god himself after death. In the time of the ancient Egyptian, there was a program, something settled, something like a law that every king has to follow. For the king to be accepted by the universal god as a god, he has to do certain requirements. Pharaohs were required to defeat the enemies of Egypt, to make offerings to the gods, to put up statues in the temples to honor the gods, and finally to build the pyramids. And a pharaoh was required to prove that he finished all that during his lifetime. This is why you see in the pyramid complexes from dynasty three to the end of the history of Egypt, you can see that in the Valley Temple, you can see all of the scenes and they repeat the scenes to say that I did this for sure, I did this for sure. Treasures are still being discovered in Egyptian mud today. Here, workmen were digging a foundation for new houses recently when they found parts of a temple from the Ramses period. The government stepped in to save the land from developers as excavation continues to find the rest of the temple. At another dig, three towns have been uncovered, all from different periods and one built on top of another. You're looking now at digging on the second level. <laughs> Workers at this site are bringing up ancient mud, mud that has covered this area for thousands and thousands of years, and bringing it up in small amounts in a seemingly primitive kind of way, but a way that is necessary nevertheless to protect the valuable archaeological discoveries below. We take a few centimeters after a few centimeters. Because we suspect that there are objects here, fragile and easily broken, so, so, so that we have to work very carefully. Each time the earth is turned over, it may yield a valuable piece of Egyptian history. Mohammed El Sagar is general director of monuments in this part of Egypt, and he showed me colorful pieces of pottery. A column from a Ramses temple found here. What would have, you would have stood here? Even a stone drain where ancient Egyptians once took a shower. Day by day, pieces of the past pile up. If you're accustomed to seeing stuff like this only in a museum, you're astounded by the sheer volume of the discoveries here. A young boy washes the mud of the centuries off each piece. His are the first eyes to see them clearly in thousands of years. When dams were built along the Nile River, many old temples were lost, covered by the waters of Lake Nasser. Some, however, were saved, and this is the most famous, Philae Temple, built during Greek and Roman times. Once half covered by the waters of the lake, it was moved to this island, where it's now open to visitors. Scholars consider the temple insignificant, but it stands as a striking example of Egypt's determination to save her history. Our next segment focuses on the one thing Egypt could not do without, the one thing that dominates Egyptian history from ancient times until today, the Nile River.
It's not the most impressive river in the world. It's not the widest or the swiftest. In fact, it can claim only to be the longest. But no other river has had more impact on people and culture for so many years. The high dam at Aswan has harnessed the power of the Nile and sends it across the desert to remote villages and towns. If you're visiting Cairo, this might be your only view of the Nile. Some tourists see it from the luxury of steamers that cruise up the river. But the best way to see the Nile is the way ancient Egyptians saw it, from the felucca boat. Our guide finds an available boat for us, and we set sail. The Nile, of course, is more than a tourist attraction, much more than a tourist attraction. And it's here, on the west bank of the Nile, where you begin to realize the important significance of this great river for all Egyptians. <laughs> A farmer sings as he pulls water from the Nile, his song part of the symphony of life along the river. the West Bank, we can see the activity of agriculture. And here, for example, this is wheat. We cultivate, they cultivate wheat and alfalfa for feeding the animals. And you can see some boys and girls that are uh, with their cattle and their buffalo, water buffalo, uh, on the side of the river. Before the Aswan Dam was built, crops along the Nile were harvested only once a year. Now the dam controls the rise and fall of the river, and there are three crops, sometimes more every year. More than a million acres have been reclaimed because of the dam. Yet some farmers still have land controlled by the Nile. The water flood over here, so he cannot cultivate any more crops. So this is the only crop which he cultivated, is onion and fig plants and some tomatoes and some uh, other vegetables. Sugarcane is the chief crop each spring. It's harvested up until April. And loaded on trains to go to market. The Egyptian government has encouraged development of the fishing industry by building a fish farm on Lake Nasser. These fishermen have put out their nets and now they beat the waters of the Nile, hoping for full nets of perch and mullet. When Herodotus, the Greek historian, visited Egypt in 450 BC, he wrote, Egypt is a gift of the River Nile. Even today, nobody in Egypt would disagree. Without the River Nile, there is no civilization. River Nile, it means life. One of the things that hit us immediately when we arrived in Egypt was that it is a country of great contrasts, ancient monuments, 6,000 years of history, and modern bustling cities with everything you'd expect to find in a major city. I wanted to take a look at some of the villages where not much about Egyptian life has changed, but even there, we found some surprises. About 40% of all Egyptians now live in towns, and more and more people want to move to towns and cities where there's promise of a better life. The marketplace in Aswan reminds you a little of our own farmer's market. There's plenty of local produce brought in from nearby farms.
and plenty of fresh meats available, though it's not refrigerated or protected from the flies. There are many festivals like this one in Luxor. People come from farms and villages miles away to celebrate the birthday of their patron saint. But Egypt's heart and soul have been linked to the land for thousands of years. There are few machines. Most work is still done by hand. Before the fields can be cultivated, a farmer must be sure his irrigation ditches are ready. Only then will his crops get precious water from the Nile. Most of Egypt is sand and rock. But where the waters of the river can be diverted, there are crops and farming villages. Here, small irrigation ditches like this one turn the desert into fertile farming area. As you can see, these vines are full of tomatoes. Water is never taken for granted when it must be sought out and saved. People here are friendly. Even the children are unafraid of strangers. Village life is a constant reminder that there is work to be done. A water buffalo is slaughtered by the village butcher. Later, he'll dress the carcass and divide it into pieces to be sold. When the sun is high in the desert sky, most work stops. It's time for a nap in the shade. There'll be time later to finish today's work when it's cooler outside. There's not even much going on at the village gathering place, the post office. We stop at the home of a 96-year-old man. We are told he is Mohammed, the big man of the village. While we wait for tea to be served, our guide talks with our host in Nubian, a language spoken by these people whose ancestors lived in southern Egypt. Lizards on the wall are friendly, and like everything else here, they have a purpose. They eat the flies. You will not see it just like that? Yes. Make it like this. Yes. Mohammed takes us on a little tour of his house. It's built around an open courtyard with domed roof and thick walls to keep out the heat. Now, how many people live in this house? My people, I'm about, uh, I got uh, five, ten boys. Ten boys? Ten boys, my wife, my... In the kitchen, there's electricity for a small refrigerator. And here you have your uh, pans. Yes, pans and uh, stuff, uh, spoon, yes. and glasses, yes. and the plate. Pots? You know, saucepan. Mini pots. Yes. yes. And I got more inside, too. Next door, Mohammed's wife is watching television. And he jokes that before he bought the TV set, his wife was always very busy. Television. Yeah, television. Uh, she used it all the time. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. She liked. She yeah. liked. He says now when she comes home from shopping in Aswan, she sits right down and watches television, which she likes very much. It's best thing to do. Before we leave, there's time to meet all of the grandchildren. Cairo people is like America. And Mohammed has a final message for everyone in America. I like the American people. He says only America can stop the fighting in the Middle East. He likes Americans and hopes they will do that because too many people are being killed. Because many people every day are dead. No good. People killed, no good. The houses of a Nubian village may look ageless, but they're actually only about 15 years old. The Nubian people used to live in the valley occupied now by Lake Nasser. When the valley was flooded by the Aswan Dam, 100,000 people had to be relocated. See this area over there? You see that little mountains, which are now are islands, you know, inside the lake. These are supposed to be uh, very high mountains behind my village. Huzia Mutar grew up in a village now covered by the lake. When tourists come here and look at this lake, mm -hmm. they say, how beautiful. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I say how sorry I am. <laughs> because, you know, everybody comes and say, oh, such a beautiful lake. And I say, oh, how sorry I am because my village is down there, you know. My family, my father and, and mother and sisters are living in Aswan. So when they come here, they always cry. But uh, we are lucky because we have plenty of water, so we can have some water for irrigation and drinking water. All of Egypt must thank the Nubian people for their sacrifice. If you visit the Ramses exhibit while it's in Charlotte, you'll see a very impressive statue of the king out in front of the museum. That statue was found in Egypt, where Ramses spent 65 years building monuments and temples. Next, we see the biggest one as we return to the land of the pharaohs. Ramses II ruled Egypt for more than 65 years. When he assumed the throne in 1279 BC, Egypt already had a long and rich history going back more than 2,000 years. Other kings had covered the land with monuments and temples. The pyramids had been standing more than 1,000 years. So had the great temple complex at Karnak. The avenue of the Sphinxes was already here when Ramses was crowned, and the pharaoh wasted no time establishing his reputation as the master builder. He expanded the temple, building what is said to be the largest hall of any temple in the world, 50,000 square feet. The roof is gone now, but still standing are the 134 columns that once supported it. Nearby, at the Temple of Luxor, Ramses put up more huge statues of himself. And on some of the statues of his father already in the temple, Ramses scratched out his father's name and replaced it with his own. In such a hurry he was to be immortal. But it is here at Abu Simbel where we see the real crowning achievement of the Pharaoh Egyptians call Ramses the Great, building this temple for his wife, Nefertari, and then creating this enormous temple for himself, the great temple of Ramses II. For this history has named him the master builder. Others have called him an egomaniac, and that he may have been. But what a glorious monument he has left us to ancient Egyptian life. At the front of the temple are four enormous statues of Ramses sitting on his throne, each statue 65 feet high. On each side of the statues and between their legs are statues of Ramses' favorite wife, Nefertari, and other members of the royal family. The temple was carved from a single stone cliff. It faces Lake Nasser today, but when it was discovered by an explorer in 1813, the lake wasn't here and the temple was at the bottom of the valley. Before the valley was flooded, there was a campaign to save the temple. Contributions poured in from around the world. It was finally moved piece by piece to higher ground. It took $36 million and nine years to finish the project. Inside, the temple is divided into three rooms, the first dominated by eight statues of Ramses. On the walls are scenes from his life. His military victories are described in these drawings. The color in many places is still excellent. And look at how the artist drew multiple images of the horse's hooves to simulate action. Nearby is part of the treaty between Egypt and the Hittites, believed to be the first treaty of its kind in history. Around the room there is graffiti on the walls, some of it dating from the 1800s, and right next to it, Egyptian graffiti written in hieroglyphics. All the Egyptian pharaohs believed they would become gods after death. But when he built this temple, Ramses set himself apart. He became the first king to declare himself a god while he was still alive. 
In the last room of the temple, called the Holy of Holies, Ramses placed statues of Egypt's three most important gods. And there, sitting between them, as a god, he put a statue of himself. You will notice that there is not any colors, any traces of any colors in these halls. There are carvings. On only the carved, only carvings. Because it was all, all this room was covered with gold. The entire room? Yeah. The temple was built facing east toward the rising sun. And twice a year on the spring and fall equinoxes, the first rays of the sun beam directly into the Holy of Holies. And when you imagine that all this room was covered, was covered with gold, and statues also were, co were covered with gold, and the doors are closed and the people waiting outside. Imagine that what happens when these doors are open and the sun's reflection is facing the people. They will believe that the God is in there. Across the River Nile on the West Bank, there is a valley called the Valley of the Kings. Here, all of ancient Egypt's noble families were buried. More than 700 tombs have been discovered on the West Bank. Ramses' tomb was lost and forgotten for more than 2,800 years until it was found in 1881. His mummy was removed, loaded on a steamer, and taken down the Nile to Cairo. As the boat moved down the river, it said that people from the villages stood on the banks, pulled their hair, and wailed in mourning, as their ancestors had done thousands of years before. Today, the mummy is not on public display, but it is still kept at the Egyptian Museum in Cairo. The arms of the great king still crossed on his chest, just as the priests placed them there more than 3,000 years ago. On the walls of his temple at Abu Simbel, the pharaoh had written, Ramses will live forever. Eternity has rarely seemed so possible for merely mortal men. Channel 9 is proud to be part of the exhibits coming to Charlotte this year, both Ramses II and a cortege of mummies. And we hope this series has helped you have a better understanding of Egyptian culture and history.